Have you ever been afraid? I suppose that's a rhetorical question. We all have. When I was a child, it seemed like nothing scared me. Well, except snakes. Snakes scared me. I despise those things. I've always been afraid of them. But when I was young, I liked to go fast and, and just to live life with reckless abandonment, really. I suppose I thought I was invincible. Now I know better. Now I understand that something as microscopic as a small little kidney stone can bring me to my knees. <laughs> now I understand that something invis invisible like a virus can make us sick or worse. What's worse is the other invisible things out there that can cripple us. That same virus can threaten a nation and a nation's economy or an entire political system. What about the systematic virus of hatred for no other reason than hatred's sake? Or the naivety of thinking that our own problems are always someone else's fault instead of owning them, coming to grips with them, and reckoning with them. What about the invisible enemy of fear, by which far too many of us have been operating out of a place of fear in our lives for far too long. As I said, when I was young, I didn't fear much. I stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon looking at a mile-long drop down below. <laughs> didn't so much as break a sweat. Now, if I stand three stories up and look down, my knees begin to weaken. <laughs> oh, how things change. But the point that I want to make is that I know, and many of you know, fear, especially unhealthy fear, can be crippling. I remember a story about two little boys whose mother asked them to chase a chicken snake out of the hen house. They looked everywhere for that snake, but they couldn't find it. And the more they looked, the more afraid they became until finally they did find it. And when that happened, <laughs> they fell all over themselves running out of the chicken house. Don't you know a chicken snake won't hurt you, their mother asked. Yes, ma'am, one of the boys answered, but there are some things that will scare you so bad you'll hurt yourself. <laughs> Most of us have been there at some point in time in our lives. Fear is a terrible thing, isn't it? All of us are afraid of something. Some of us disguise our fear better than others, but fear can make our lives miserable. But there have been times when we've been really afraid for a variety of reasons, and it comforts us to read about the disciples of Jesus as they experience what it is to be afraid too. It's getting dark, a storm has come, the boat's a considerable distance from the land, the boat is being buffeted by the waves because the wind is against it. And these experienced fishermen are becoming increasingly anxious because even in the hands of experienced sailors, a small boat on treacherous waters can be frightening. And so the disciples are frightened. And then something quite extraordinary happens, something that shakes them to the core. Jesus comes out to them walking on water. <laughs> and now they're really terrified. It's a ghost, they cry out in fear. But Jesus says to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Friends, Jesus' words are as much for you and me as they were for those disciples. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. You see, there's something that we need to understand, and what we need to understand is that fear is our enemy. I've learned in life that fear can limit us, it can defeat us, and it can cause us to fail. It is fear 
that paralyzes our lives, that causes us to shrink back from achieving our goals. It is fear that keeps us unhappy and dissatisfied with ourselves. It is fear that haunts our marriages. It is fear that keeps many of us from succeeding in work or being happy at home. Fear blinds us to our possibilities and it binds us to our comfort zones and our safety, no safety nets, even if those things are unproductive or damaging. Fear produces sleepless nights as we worry about events over which we ultimately have no control. Fear makes us afraid to face life, to face hard truths, and it can even make us run from God. In the book of Genesis, we read where Adam and Eve had taken some of the forbidden fruit and eaten it, something which had been specifically denied them. And knowing that God is searching for them, they attempt to hide. It's a scene perhaps reminiscent of many of our childhoods when we had done something bad and we want to hide from our searching parents. God, of course, finds them and, and then asks them why they're hiding. You remember the response of, that Adam gave? Adam says, because I was afraid. I think this story reminds us that fear goes all the way back to the beginning of time. To be human is to experience fear. In the Peanuts cartoon strip, Charlie Brown goes to Lucy for a nickel's worth of psychiatric help. She proceeds to pinpoint his particular fear. Perhaps, she says, you have hypogenophobia, which is the fear of responsibility. Charlie Brown says, no, that's not it. Well, perhaps you have allurophobia, which is the fear of cats. Nah. Well, then maybe you have climacophobia, which is the fear of falling downstairs. <laughs> no, that's not it either. Exasperated, Lucy says, well, maybe you have pantophobia, which is the fear of everything. Yes, says Charlie Brown, that's the one. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like that. We feel like we are afraid of everything. We're afraid of people. We're afraid about the future. We're afraid of the past. We're afraid of life. We're afraid of death. Every person, every Christian, we must be able to fight these fears. Even Paul, the apostle and the evangelist, the church starter, the one who had been beaten and shipwrecked, even snake bitten, had to fight back his fears. He wrote of his arrival in Corinth. When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. Paul faced fear, just like you and me. And today Jesus reminds the disciples and he reminds us not to be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's how we would like to live. So how do we do it? Author Zig Ziglar tells about the 2002 Winter Olympics when 16-year-old Sarah Hughes skated her way to a gold medal. Sarah stepped on the ice, says Zig, not believing that she had any chance of winning any medal. So she just skated with reckless abandon unconcerned about the live audience, the television audience, or for that matter, the judges. She just gave it her all. And that sheer abandon she exhibited, she expressed the total joy that she was feeling at the time. And she turned in a spectacular performance, winning the gold. Now, Michelle Kwan, on the other hand, skated after Sarah. And she was expected to win the gold. She was a true champion, beloved by skating fans all over the world, the recipient of many medals in her career. But after Sarah Hughes' flawless performance, Michelle went out determined to not make any mistakes. Determined to not make any mistakes, consequently, she fell and took home the bronze. 
Zig Ziglar contends that while Sarah was focused on what to do, Michelle was focused on what to avoid doing. And that made the difference. That is what fear continually does to us. We fear failure, and the very act of fearing causes us to fail. We fear the future, and because of that fear, we sabotage opportunities that come to us. We fear sickness and pain and death, and the weight of that worry increases the chances that illness will overtake us. And that is why Jesus' words are so important to us. Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. So what does this all mean? How can we overcome fear? We overcome fear by keeping our eye on Jesus. Peter wants to walk out to meet Jesus on that water. He even steps out of the boat, which, by the way, is a really big deal. It takes an extraordinary amount of faith to take that first step. But he makes the same mistake that we so often make. He takes his eye off Jesus. He looks around at the wind, looks down at the waves, and he begins to sink. I wonder how many of us have made that same mistake. We can focus on our fear or we can focus on our faith. Focusing on our fear will distract us and ultimately cause us to fail. Focusing on our faith, however, will cause us to succeed because we will be in the will of God. And being in the will of God will always breed success regardless of life's circumstances or measurements by the world standards. Brothers and sisters, I implore you, keep your eyes upon Jesus. Like Peter when our eyes are fixed on Christ, we can do incredible things. And when we take our eyes off Him, we sink. Simon Peter looked to Christ and he walked on water. (laughs) He took his eyes off of Christ, looked at the wind and the waves, and he got scared and he began to sink. Some years ago, there was a little girl who was so excited because her dad was going to take her to the movie Snow White. Someone said to the little girl, but won't you be scared of the Wicked Witch? No, she said. When the witch comes on, I won't look at her. I'll just look at my daddy. (laughs) She looked to her father. That's the way it works, doesn't it? When we fix our eyes on Him, we can do incredible things. Look at Peter. Peter stands up. He puts a foot over the side of that boat and he steps out onto the sea. His eyes are fixed on Jesus. And he's doing great. He's actually doing it. He's walking on the water. The text explains to us he came toward Jesus. Indeed, there are times that Christ bids us to walk on water, to throw off the comfort zone of the familiar, to venture out onto the realm or into the realm of the impossible. And yet, those wet, windy, dark, Fearful challenges keep us in that boat. They keep us glued to our seats. Yet Jesus says, come. So Peter did. But then, then he looked down. He saw the waves. He heard the howl of the winds. And he began to sink. And screaming out to Jesus, he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out to a troubled Peter with that sustaining hand. I tell you, there is a powerful point made here, one that we should never forget. 
For as long as Peter fixed his eyes on Jesus and only glanced at his circumstances, he was sustained. He, he was able to do the impossible. However, when he fixed his eyes on his circumstances and he only glanced at Jesus, he sank. Peter's not the only one to make that mistake. The Bible is filled with examples. The spies who went into the promised land came back and gave the reports. Ten of them had fixed their eyes on the inhabitants of the land, and they were like giants, and the Israelites were like grasshoppers by comparison in their estimation. But two of the spies glanced at those same giants, and they fixed their eyes on God and said that the Israelites should go and take possession of that land. David fixed his eyes on Bathsheba, another man's wife. He had no business, no right doing that, king or not. He fixed his gaze upon her, and he only glanced at God. And as a result, he entered the darkest period of his life. The list goes on and on and on. You see, it is a matter of perspective, and it is a matter of faith. Is that not true for us? Is it not true for churches? You see, I think churches that reach people today are churches that are willing to step out of the boat for Christ. They're churches willing to go to where people are, people whom other churches shy away from. You see, the temptation is great to say, oh, yes, I trust Christ, and, and then sit passively in our little comfort zone. It's another thing to step out of the boat, to attempt to walk on water, to attempt the thing that we have never attempted before in Christ's name. I want to challenge you to keep your eyes upon Jesus. Don't be afraid to walk out on the water. And if your boat is being buffeted by the wind and the waves, if you've entered a stormy season in your life, listen to the Master. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And do not be afraid to walk out onto the water. That is the message of today's lesson from this gospel. I think maybe, maybe that was what Jesus loved in Simon Peter. Not so much his rashness, but his unbridled boldness. There is one who knows your situation and can help you through it, no matter how troubling or terrifying. And if you feel as if the wind and the waves are already around you, that storm is about to consume you. Then like Peter, cry out to him, Lord, save me! And feel the touch of his hand, the security of his embrace, for he will not let you be overwhelmed in the storm. He is your rock. He is your salvation. He is your fortress. And he is your comfort in the storm. Praise be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you. We thank you and we praise you for this word in which you have given us today. Lord, we pray that you would give us the boldness and the conviction that we would fix our eyes on you and not our circumstances. Lord, call us to be faithful followers. Equip us and empower us to be able to be faithful to you, even in the darkest of days, in the troubling storms that may surround us. In the midst of it all, Lord, you are God. You are Lord. And we lean and we look to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As always in these days, we want to be able to stay connected to you as much as possible. We know how difficult these last few months are. And so I'd like to once again offer opportunity. If any of you have made decision for Christ today or in recent weeks, or if any of you are having troubles in your faith or troubles in your life, if any of you need some encouragement, 
or if there's anything that we as a church can do for you, we want to be there for you. If you just need us to be able to lift you up in prayer, then we want to hear that as well. If you'll call the number below or you can send us an email, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to pray for you and we'd love to encourage you and be there for you in any way that we're able to. God's blessings be with you today and this week. Amen.